Well, thank you everyone for uh, bearing with us with a little bit of the technical difficulty. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Anthony Powell, who will be speaking about the Buffalo Soldiers and their history through the eyes of his grandfather, who was a 40 year veteran of the Buffalo Soldiers. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Powell. Good early evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are not in California, good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Powell. Uh, the image you see is of my grandfather. His name was uh, Samuel Nathaniel Waller. My grandfather served in the army from 1887 until 1927. I was very privileged to be raised by my grandmother and my grandfather. So I lived around a bunch of old veterans for a good portion of my life. When I was a young man thinking I knew everything in the world, I had the audacity to ask my grandfather one day why he joined this racist country's army. Now this is back in the late 50s. And my grandfather told me something that I would never forget. He said that the army gave him the only part of the American dream that the nation would let him share in. Now, when I first heard that, I thought, oh my God, granddad is an Uncle Tom but I was wrong. It took me a number of years to appreciate exactly what this person had told me. He told me that it gave him the only part of the American dream. What does that mean? Well, it meant for my grandfather, who was a 13 year old when he talked his way into the army in 1887, totally illiterate. If you had known my grandfather, you would have thought that at least he had a BA degree. All of his education was through the army. After being around he and his friends for a very long time, they gave me images, uniforms, and things like that. But what they also gave me was a connection to who these people were. And my grandfather's friends appreciated the fact that they were Americans. And so going through our history, many people would think, well, what do you mean they appreciated the fact coming from slavery? Well, yes, we did. We were the people that built these United States that we live in today. Not just with the sweat of our brow, but we built it with the blood of our bodies. And that continues on to this day. So often in our 21st century world, sometimes we start going backwards in time. But we should always remember to keep ourselves rooted to the present and to the future and the past as our backdrop of what we have done. There's an interesting thing about being an American today. And through my grandfather's eyes, I appreciated all of this. When I was a kid, we said the Pledge of Allegiance, we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic to which it stands one nation indivisible, not under God, with liberty and justice for all. You know that under God was not put into the Pledge of Allegiance until the height of the Cold War in the early 60s. But what does it mean for us to have this love of liberty? When I look at our Pledge of Allegiance, and I look at people that come from the four corners of our planet to this place called America, well, why do they come? And in the 21st century, they, they still come. They come for the last sentence of our pledge with liberty and justice for all. That is what America is. And when we think about what makes America great, it is the people that are here. It is the people of our ancestors, like my grandfather, like the people that he was raised around in the military. Those people sacrificed for all of us. And so the presentation that I wanna share with you is a, is a presentation that I put together many years ago uh, as a tribute to my grandfather. And I did an exhibit that traveled uh, throughout uh, the United States called Buffalo Soldier, but it was all time for the love of liberty and why these men like my grandfather had this view. So I'm going to click onto different images 
and we'll go through them. And, you know, as you can tell, we had a little hard time. I am not all that technical. But the images that you'll see are images of the first African-American regular army soldiers. The first one is images of soldiers towards the end of the Civil War. Yes, our grandfathers served. Our grandfathers served from servitude. Some of those that were, were free, they served this country. Why? To keep our country indivisible, which means undivided. The next image again shares, and most of these images came from the, the lens of my grandfather's cameras that he used over his 40 years in the army. I don't know if you can see the captions on them, but it tells the story of these individuals. At the end of the Civil War, there was a vast part of America that was still waiting to be colonized. African-American soldiers of the USC Colored Troops, the 125th USC Colored Infantry was the first unit to be sent from Kansas down into Texas. And this is at right at the end of the Civil War. And the experience that they went through was a, a very interesting experience because many of these men had not been west of the Mississippi at that time. Going to the next image, you'll see images of uh, the early years of the African-American soldier. I know it's touted by historians today that uh, African-American soldiers had the, had the least desertions in the army. And you know, that would be true, but it was a process. It would take a number of years for that to happen. When the regiments were first organized, African-American soldiers, deserted just as fast as anyone else. Why? Because being a soldier at that time was rough. It was hard. Disease was the main killer of those early soldiers after the Civil War. The occupations that they did after the Civil War were not just, uh, you know, soldiering. These individuals, because you have to remember that the Western frontier, the post had been abandoned during the Civil War. And all of those posts had to be rebuilt, reoccupied. I have heard some of the things that people have said about the African-American soldiers um, that are mythology. And you may have heard some of the same things. I'll give you an example. They say they got the worst horses and the worst equipment in the army. That's not true. They received the same Civil War surplus items that every regular army soldier received. They lived in the same beat down ratty post that every soldier after the Civil War lived in until those places could be rebuilt. They say they had the worst horse flesh. They did not. They had the same animals that were used for horses during the Civil War. It wasn't until 1872 that the United, the United States Army resupplied all of his soldiers. Again, I've had people say, well, the black regiments got their equipment last because their numbers were last. That's not true. If you know anything about quartermastering, if you know anything about soldiering, that's just a mythology. They received the same equipment. They lived in the same post. They received the same horse flesh. But does that mean that they had the attitudes that many people portray them as having? Let me give you a for instance. Many of you have probably heard that black soldiers really did not like fighting Native Americans in the West. Not quite true. Unfortunately, African-American soldiers had the same attitudes as whites in relationship to Native Americans. Not all but a good majority of them did. After a while, their combat helped them to become elite soldiers. And when I say combat, you're talking about, these are not combat situations that you had in the Civil War where thousands of soldiers were fighting against each other. These were combat situations where small companies and troops were engaged in. And African-American soldiers were really some of the best in that kind of warfare. 
and they earn the respect of Native Americans. Again, you probably heard that, oh, Native Americans gave them the name Buffalo Soldier because of their woolly hair look like the mane of the buffalo. If you were a Native American and your sacred animal was the buffalo that you use for everything in life, for food, for medicine, for clothing, would you give that name to someone who was taking your land and killing your people? No, you would not. But there was a clan of warriors, especially among the Lakota. They were called the Clan of the Buffalo Warriors. And the Cheyenne and Lakota had that clan of warriors and only the best warriors could be a part of that clan. From the early years of the 1870s, references have been made that Native Americans called these soldiers Buffalo soldiers, but they also called them white men in black faces. But the Buffalo soldier issue is the respect that they had for the valor of these men. And that is something that should not be forgotten. And I think it's something that I like adding because history as far as I'm concerned, history should always be taught the good, the bad, the indifferent, and also the ugly, because that is what history is all about. And throughout the course of the early 1870s, early 1880s, Black soldiers at the 1880s and by 1890 were some of the key soldiers of the United States Army. For what? For discipline? for being soldiers who rarely ever deserted. And the irony of all of that is that when they were protecting settlers, white settlers in West Texas and East Texas, African-Americans were being lynched and burned at the stake. But yet these men fulfilled their duty as soldiers. And when you look at movies, and don't get me wrong, I, I think John Wayne was, was a great actor. I still watch his movies to this day. But when you see the cavalry riding to the rescue, you never see a black soldier. I have recounted every engagement performed by American troops from the end of the Civil War to 1893. And 89% of those battles were fought by African-American soldiers. And that's something that I think uh, we should not forget. But telling the story of these men, when you look at these men, what do you see? As I was growing up, I saw no images of African-American soldiers at the movies or on the television. I only saw cartoon images of these men. But when I look at the images that my grandfather took with his camera, I see dignified, honorable soldiers to whom these soldiers were certainly dignified and honorable. The man where my cursor is on is a soldier who's wearing a medal. Some people confuse it with the Congressional Medal of Honor. It is not. It is called the Army Navy Union Medal. And this was the organization that predated the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars and the American Legion. And this uh, was, they were active until about the mid uh, turn of the century. Again, when you look at images of African-American soldiers, they're, again, dignified soldiers. I I'm gonna read one of the captions I had. The troops and companies of the black regiments became tightly knit family and to depart without permission would have been indefensible. Blacks expected little from military life and were seldom disappointed by the harsh life and small rewards. But yet the soldiers continued to serve in this army. Then again, when you think about the life of a soldier during that time, um, was it a life that uh, kept them away from problems that we Americans had, problems with race, problems with prejudice, problems with these other things? Well, it did not. 
and black soldiers would normally address these issues. Sometimes it was with violence in order to protect themselves and to protect their loved ones. All right, I'm on a roll now. Um, again, the images that you see here, many of the images were taken by my grandfather. I still have this camera uh, that he used to take a lot of the images, glass plates that are part of my collection that my uh, grandfather took the pictures uh, with. But I guess the main thing is that when you look at these soldiers, I want you to take a look at your uncles, your grandfathers, your cousins, in-laws, because that is exactly who they were and who they are to this day. Individuals that cared not just for themselves, but cared for who, were, who they were, soldiers of a country that they helped to build and defend. Now, African-American soldiers did not only serve in the regular army, but they served in the National Guards from the end of the Civil War all the way through World War II. African-American soldiers not only served in the East in the National Guards, but they served in the South. The Southern National Guard uh, unit served until after the Spanish-American War. By 1910, most had been disbanded. Those in the East continued to serve, those in Ohio, those in Chicago, those in Indiana continued to serve until World War II. But one of the keys of being a soldier during that time was the issue of money. How much money did a soldier make? A private made $13 a month. How could you argument that pay? Well, you can argument that pay by being a marksman during the target year, it gave you $2 a month. If you were an expert marksman, it gave you $3 a month. If you became a distinguished marksman, it gave you $4 a month for the target year. So you may wonder why so many African-American soldiers were so good when it came to target practice. It wasn't, they just wanted to be good soldiers, but it added something to their income at that time. The gentleman on the bottom is, uh, he served during the, um, from 1885 until he retired in the mid 1900s and he went back into the army uh, during World War I. His name was Horace Bivens. He was one of the best pistol shots and rifle shots throughout his career in the military. Again, you look at the soldiers, the bottom image is, is very important because you have a couple of Ninth Cavalrymen that are Congressional Medal of Honor recipients. And these soldiers were the escort for the body of uh, Colonel Edward Hatch, who had died while he was on duty. And they escorted his body back to his hometown, which was a privilege on the part of those soldiers because they had the utmost respect for General Hatch. Again, images of soldiers, very important thing. Look at the images, look at the faces, and what do you see? You see yourself. You see others that served. And I'm just going to flip through a couple of these just to give you an idea of who these men were. And thank goodness that my grandfather took all of the pictures that he did. There was a unit that was called the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts. This unit served from uh, the mid 1870s and they served until the unit was disbanded in 1914. The enlisted personnel were transferred to the 9th and 10th Cavalry. But the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts won five Congressional Medals of Honor during their service. And the unit never numbered over 30 individuals but they were key because they knew Native Americans, because they were part Native Americans and had lived among them for all of their lives. 
some have said that African American soldiers have only served in the four black units. Well, that's not true. African American soldiers served in integrated units, such as the center pitcher is a medical corps unit. The sergeant sitting uh, on the very left had been a soldier during the Civil War. He was African American. The other one was a uh, private who had been in the Army for a couple of years. The soldier on the top was Moses Williams, who had served in the Ninth Cavalry, won the Congressional Medal of Honor, became an ordnance sergeant. The one on the bottom served in the Corps of Engineers. And this would continue on until World War II, that you would see African-American sergeants, privates serving with white soldiers. Again, pictures of those soldiers that just tells a story. And if the pictures could only talk. The last Indian campaign that the Americans had was uh, the campaign with uh, Sitting Bull. And this was at uh, Pine Ridge. Unfortunately, a lot of Native Americans were butchered and killed during that engagement. African-American soldiers were there also. Uh, Troop K of the 9th Cavalry was so distinguished that when they returned home, they were one of the first African-American troops to go to Fort Myer, Virginia as a garrison. And this would happen for a four year period uh, during the late 1800s or 1890s. Congressional Medals of Honor, African-Americans indeed won for valor. But you know, so often we don't talk about the men that commanded these soldiers. And those men were just like their generation. Some were good, some were excellent, some were bad and some were ugly. But most of them, after a time, would appreciate the fact that they were serving with some of the best troopers in the United States military. And they would never be ashamed of their service with any of those units. Frank Armstrong, the person that is on the right, graduated from West Point, I think it was a class of 91 or 1890. I was privileged to know uh, his son who gave me all of his father's things dealing with his time with uh, the African-American units. He served with the 9th Cavalry for 22 years. Uh, his son graduated from West Point um, right after the outbreak of uh, World War II. But again, the officers, we're no different than the people of their generation. And that's important to always remember. In the very beginning of the black units, there were no black chaplains. The chaplains were white. And these chaplains were charged with doing something that was very important. It was the education of the illiterate enlisted men, both white and black. So for a soldier like my grandfather who joined the army, totally illiterate, the army insisted that you attend post school. And that was where their education began. I have some pictures with white and black soldiers that are in some of the class that the uh, chaplains conducted. But that was something that the army instituted in the early years. And it's still one of the things that helps private soldiers advance. I have a very good friend she joined the army in the mid 60s as an army private. She was so smart that the army sent her to medical school. She ended up being a doctor. She transferred from the army to the Navy. Um, and her last transfer was to, she was a Colonel in the United States Air Force right before her retirement. But this shows the opportunities that the military offered to all people, but especially people of color. West Point, everybody's heard of Henry O. Flipper. Some have heard of John Hanks Alexander and many have heard of Charles Young. All of their lives at West Point were not the best for an American, but they endured it. And why did they endure it? They endured it for their progeny to come, for you and I. 
in the 21st century, you go to West Point, you go to Annapolis, you go to the Air Force Academy, you will see people of all ethnic backgrounds in our military academies. Why? Because they are all Americans. These men made that possible. Again, pictures of uh, Flipper, Alexander Young, uh, the one at the top is Cadet uh, Johnson C. Whitaker, who was dismissed before graduation. And that's a long story, but it's a story that uh, I get into in some of my lectures. Now we come to the African-American chaplain. The first chaplain was Henry V. Plummer. And he had served uh, in the uh, Union Navy during the Civil War, uh, educated himself, became a minister, and became a chaplain, the first African-American chaplain in the United States Army. The second one was Alan Allensworth, who for those of you in California know Allensworth, California. We know a lot about him because he made this place his home. The third was Theophilus Gordon Stewart, who was a wonderful chaplain, a very literate man who would serve in the army until 1911. His son would serve during the Spanish-American War as an officer. And then we have one of my best guys, George Washington Prealu. Prealu was a man of letters and he was not, he would write what he felt in his heart. In some of the letters that I have from him, he's talking about being a soldier in America during the 1890s and all of that, but he doesn't skirt over the problems that they had. As a matter of fact, for those that live in California, when he retired in 1921, he became the founder of the first AME church in Los Angeles. And that church is still is in existence today. Then we have William Anderson. He was not only a minister, but he was also a doctor. And he served with the unit for many, many years. Again, we talk about school. The chaplain's job. This is a program that I have the original copy from Allensworth School. And for some of the enlisted men that were literate, both white and black, they were used as teachers during the process of educating the illiterate soldiers. Band music is something that people talk about all the time, you know, hearing the, you know, the bands play. African-American bandsmen were some of the best in the country. You might say, why do I say that? Because their music was loved no matter where they went. And these musicians could not only play martial tunes, but they could play the symphonic selections of the day. And as the 10th century turned to the 20th century, they would even get down with the ragtime and jazz, but their ability as musicians was par excellence. And again, looking at the men, the uniforms they wear, I have many of these in my collection that were given to me by the soldiers that you see in those pictures. The bandmasters of those units for many years were white. They were the highest paid enlisted man in the army. The first African-American to be a bandmaster was with the 10th Cavalry in the late 1890s. And he became band leader for about a year, and then he retired. It wasn't until after the turn of the century you would get regular Army band leaders on a regular basis. The 9th Cavalry Band at Silver Springs, New Mexico. And again, the music was superb. The 24th Infantry Band, 9th Cavalry Band, and the 10th Mounted Cavalry Band. One of the things that's important about Army life is family. And even though a lot of soldiers did not marry until late in life, the family nucleus was still there. And these women and these children went every place that their husbands went. If it was changing posts in old frontier wagons, I had a good a good friend of mine is uh, he was born in a escort wagon 
while his regiment was moving, 10th Cavalry was moving to a different location. But the family stayed together. The children would generally follow in the footsteps of their fathers. And African-American soldiers, they not only married black women, but they would marry Native Americans, they would marry Hispanics. And sometimes you'd see some married to white women also. And as we went into the Far East, a lot of these soldiers married Filipinas. And after World War II, a many Koreans and Japanese. But again, looking at images of these people, I think it's important because we can visualize who these people were. As I was saying, living on an army post was not the best. The picture on the left is uh, a Seminole Negro Indian scout, his home in Texas. The thing was that the army only provided quarters for officers and their families. If an enlisted man wanted to have his family on post, they would have to build a shelter for them. This would be the same thing until well after World War I. So army life, depending on where you're at, could be great. Sometimes it could be a problem. But the soldiers and their families stayed together, lived together. Again, pictures of children, pictures of family, another one of... Uh, a Seminole Negro Indian fort at uh, Fort Clark in Texas. And some of the women that followed the standards. The picture at the top is a funeral. It was a funeral of uh, Emmanuel Stance, who was a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient and who was murdered by a couple of his men. Now, as I said, history is good bad and different and ugly, but it's history. And that's the most important thing of all, learning that at the end of the day, we're just all humans, we're all people. Spanish-American War offered opportunities for African-Americans, the opportunities uh, for non-commissioned officers to become officers uh, was out of this world. Unfortunately, it couldn't hold true during the early turn of the century. And you see the 24th Infantry leaving uh, Salt Lake City, the 9th Cavalry also leaving, getting ready to go to the war. Troopers that are at the docks in Tampa, Florida, 9th Cavalrymen. And then some of the soldiers that would serve not only in the regulars, but Many African-American NCOs of the regulars would be commissioned in the volunteers as uh, second lieutenant up to captain. And these are the National Guard units that uh, served stateside and abroad. These are two soldiers of the Virginia, six Virginia volunteers. That National Guard unit lasted until about 1915. These are pictures of uh, soldiers of the 9th uh, Battalion of Ohio National Guard. And these were soldiers of uh, the 9th United States Volunteers. These men were enlisted from the coastal sections of Mississippi and Louisiana. And they would serve in Cuba uh, as occupation troops. Again, soldiers, families, these are pictures that were taken in Cuba. After the Spanish-American War, the 10th Cavalry was one of the garrison regiments at Cuba. And it wasn't until 1900 that a segment of the regiment was sent as the uh, uh, home squadron, but was eventually sent to the Philippine Islands in 1901. Same thing would happen to the 9th Cavalry. Again, soldiers, their wives, as I mentioned before, black soldier and his Filipino wife, 
The one in the center is Walter Bruce Williams and his uh, uh, soon to be wife, Ella Dyson. Walter Bruce Williams would be the longest Sergeant Major in the Army. He served with the 24th Infantry, he became Sergeant Major in 1900. He would be commissioned as a captain during uh, World War I and would retire soon after that. The first African American regiment to arrive in the Philippines was the 24th Infantry Regiment. And you see these are the men in formation once they landed in the Philippines. Sergeant Major Green and other 24th Infantry members uh, getting ready to go to the Philippines and some in the islands. The Philippine operation for America was the first time that African-American soldiers did something um, that some of us look down upon, but if you understood the time period, maybe not. Some African-American soldiers deserted and they joined the Filipino cause for liberty and freedom. You might ask why? Well, it was real simple. At this particular time, back home, African-Americans were still being lynched and burned at the stake. When they got to the Philippines, what they found was that the average American soldier, they didn't call the Filipinos the flips or the, the gukas. They would call them that, but they called them the niggas and the little black monkeys. And they did this all in front of these African-American soldiers thinking, oh, well, that's what you are back home. But for a few of them, they took this personally and they felt that if they were gonna die for freedom, why not die for real freedom? And I know it's controversial. Some of my friends say, well, but they were still traitors. Yes, they were. But they were traitors for what cause? Something that we Americans treasure, liberty and freedom. One of the things that you'll find if you've ever studied the Philippine American War was that we were just as brutal as anyone else. How so? We used the hanging booth quite a bit for insurgents when we would catch them, as an example, when we would catch them. And this went on and on and on. Again, images of African-American soldiers. The ones at the top are members of the 25th Infantry. Uh, one is Chambers, he's a, uh, one of the regimental non-commissioned staff. The one in the center is Morrow, and the one on the end is uh, the quartermaster sergeant of the regiment. But they saw extensive combat in the jungles of the Philippines and on many of the islands. Going back to the chaplains, the chaplains were generally there. The picture at the top is Chaplain Allensworth and the picture at the bottom is Chaplain Theophilus Stewart. Images of troops at San Francisco getting ready to depart for the Philippines. This was taken in 1899, a troop of the 10th Cavalry, Troop K. These are the regimental officers and color guard of the 9th Cavalry, San Francisco. Uh, the chaplain is George Washington Prelude getting ready to depart to the Philippines. In the Philippine Islands, was a not the first time we wore khaki, but it was uh, when we start using it on a regular basis. The only place that you would see khaki worn by soldiers was generally in some parts of the Southwest and in some parts of the South. The man at the top, his name was Edward L. Baker. This soldier had joined the 9th Cavalry. Um, he was a French and black parentage, spoke fluent French. He became Sergeant Major of the uh, 9th Cavalry in the early 1890s. He was allowed to attend the French Cavalry School, which he returned from in 1897. Uh, he was an expert equestrian soldier. He was promoted a first lieutenant, then a captain during the Spanish-American War. At the end of the war, he was hoping that he would be able to become a regular commission officer 
in the cavalry, but unfortunately it didn't happen. He spent the remainder of his military career as an officer in the Philippine scouts. Uh, when he returned home in 1909, 1910, he was a broken man. He didn't live, he lived maybe two more years. One of the problems was that here was a man who was very educated, who knew the operations of cavalry, but was passed over for promotion because he was a little bit older. They did promote, and I hope the picture comes up, two soldiers that would become officers uh, that you would hear about in the new century. One was uh, Benjamin O. Davis Sr., who had served during the Spanish-American War as, uh, as a commission officer in one of the volunteer units. He served as Sergeant Major, Squadron Sergeant Major of the 9th Cavalry. He took the competitive examination and was promoted a second lieutenant. But he was in his early 20s, whereas Baker was getting up into his 50s. The other person who was commissioned at that time has almost been forgotten in history. His name was John Ernest Green. He had served with the 24th Infantry as an enlisted man, took the competitive examination while he was in the Philippines with the 24th, and was commissioned in 1901. Uh, the old army, if you were commissioned as an officer, they would transfer you from your regiment to a different one if you had been an enlisted man. So he was transferred to the 25th Infantry in which he would spend the next almost 30 years uh, you know, going from second lieutenant to lieutenant colonel of that uh, unit. Again, images of the turn of the century, things that changed, but some things that remained the same. Opportunities were still withheld. African-American soldiers were still looking to truly become a part of this American dream. And when you look at the soldiers, whether they're at the 24th Infantry, the, the image at the top, 25th Infantry, 10th Cavalry, or the 9th Cavalry, you'll see dignified, honorable soldiers and men who love this country, despite the fact that the country didn't have much love for them. This is a picture of one of my most favorite guys. His name is John Roy Lynch. He became an attorney at the end of the Civil War. Um, he was from, John Roy was from Kentucky. He served as a payment. Well, he also, let me back up. He became a state congressman and a state senator. And he also served in the US Congress during Reconstruction. Very articulate man. He became a uh, paymaster in the volunteers. And then after the war, uh, the, the president appointed him a regular army paymaster, which he was the only one. Uh, you wouldn't see another African-American paymaster into World War II. Uh, but John Roy Lynch had a fabulous career. His life would and uh, during the early 40s, he was over 100 years old. And I was talking about John Ernest Green. That's John, the two pictures of him, handsome young man. But here's a picture in the center. Even though he was now an officer and a gentleman, do you notice what role that he's in? He's all by himself on the back row. He still had to deal with the color situation at that time. Uh, these are pictures of uh, Walter Howard Loving, who was the founder of the Philippine Constabulary Band, which became world renowned. The other is George Thomas, who had served with the uh, uh, Ninth Cavalry, 24th Infantry became a, an officer in the Philippine Scouts. And the other officers, uh, Chaplain Anderson, and those are two former soldiers who were working for the insular government at that time. Back in California, after the turn of the century, the 9th Cavalry 
was not only stationed at the Presidio of Monterey, but Presidio of San Francisco. The 9th Cavalry would be used. This picture is the escort of President Roosevelt, and his escort was a troop of the 9th Cavalry, officered by Charles Young. Wonderful picture. And it just shows how change could occur. Even sometimes it would take a little time. Ninth Cavalry troopers stationed in San Francisco at the Presidio would track to the national parks, as did the soldiers in your home, Monterey. They would go from Monterey to the national parks. They would be really the first park rangers and the first African-American troops to serve in the California national parks were members of Company B, 24th Infantry in 1899. And they've almost been missed in history also. But the work that these men did was absolutely outstanding because at that particular time, there was no park service. So the military had to take care of the poaching and all of those things that were done. They built the roads. Each of the troops would go in and they'd be assigned to do a specific task. And that's exactly what they did. And when you go to the national parks, you will see some of these roads that these uh, African-American soldiers and white soldiers, you know, who were doing duty at the park also. And Charles Young would become the first African-American superintendent. If I'm not mistaken, it would be Sequoia Kings Canyon. There are some images of the route from San Francisco. I also should have an image of the route from Monterey also. These are soldiers on Morro Rock in 1903. These are members of the uh, crew that uh, the soldiers worked with to build the roads. Before the National Park Service came about, park rangers in certain wooded areas would be the ones that would help fight the fires, but the army was also used. Uh, during the 1910 fires in Montana and Idaho, the 25th Infantry was used. The ranger that was with them cited them for extraordinary valor. As the flames were coming, the townspeople of Avery panicked. They brought a train in to load the women on. Fire was coming real fast in order to keep the women and children from jumping because of the heat and the flames, these soldiers stood on the exterior, keeping the women in, keeping the children safe through the gauntlet of fire. Those are the things that African-American soldiers did. And in some parts of that country today, white racism, prevails. And that's rather ironic if you look back in history. Chaplain Prelu on his uh, horse. That picture was uh, taken around 1910. These are the non-commissioned officers of the 10th Cavalry. And the 10th Cavalry did not get the designation of Buffalo Soldiers or the Buffalo Soldier Regiment until 1911. The order that you see, I have the original order uh, for the crest that would become the crest of the Buffalo Soldiers of the 10th Cavalry. Again, you see the officers and enlisted men, and I use this picture to show officers of uh, the colleges, the professors of military science. Again, there's John Green. Uh, he was at Wilberforce at the time, and he was in command of uh, the contingent that was there, Charles Young, Beale Davis. Each of those served time at Wilberforce. But you see a soldier who's part of the Medical Corps, a soldier who is part of uh, uh, the soldiers who enlisted individuals into the Army, and an African-American soldier and his wife who served in the uh, Quartermaster Corps. A picture of the four black chaplains of the turn of the century. Uh, Washington Gladden, um, George Prelo, and 
you have Oscar Scott and Chaplin Anderson. Again, it's about family. Uh, I have many, many pictures showing families, you know, with the units. These are pictures. The one I always liked is the one on the bottom. It is the transport home. This is 1909. The regiment is getting ready to go home. And on the transport vessels that took the troops home, their families went also. Not just the officer's family, but the enlisted men's family. And that's what you see, the children looking over. And I think that's just a wonderful picture. Vance Hunter Marchbanks and his family, the little boy would become a surgeon uh, during uh, World War II. He would graduate from Howard University Medical School. He would become the first African-American surgeon with the space program in the early 60s. And he was an army brat. Again, pictures showing soldiers, their wives, their children. My grandfather wrote on this picture, life was good in those days. This is a picture that was taken outside of Fort Lawton, Washington. And it was the non-commissioned staff and band who had a beach party for their families. Leslie King was the band leader. And um, it, it just shows you that life could be pretty good during that time period. Again, picture of family. This is a picture of Stephen Starr. He retired from the army in 1902. He served during the Civil War, during the Indian Wars, during the Spanish-American War, and he served in the Philippines. He lived in Oakland, California when he passed away. And he had four sons. Believe it or not, the cute guy on his mother's lap is a, is a boy. But back during that time, they dressed us up in a whole bunch of stuff that you couldn't tell the difference. Again, family, wives, soldiers in their wives, the medals that they wear. So I'm gonna pause it here, just in case you may have a question that you want to ask me. But the last one deals with the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts who were disbanded in 1915. But again, you look at the men, you look at the individuals, you look at the family, that's what they all were. So if anyone has questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer it because I can go on with this show and tell for quite a long time. So just let me know. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, right now, I'd like to open up the floor to people. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat or the Q&A on the bottom of the screen and we can, and I'll read them out loud for to Anthony. Um, so one question is, where did you find this information online? There was no online when I started. I found it through interviews with my grandfather, with his friends. Remember, I was raised by my grandparents. All of their friends were soldiers. I have over 400 letters that these people wrote, soldiers and officers between the late 1860s to the start of World War I. Uniforms were given to me by my grandfather, by their friends chaplains, graduates of West Point. So it was just a lot of, you know, going to the library. I spent a lifetime at the LA main library reading rare books, trying to find information. But you can find a lot of information online today, but some of it may be mythology. You have to make sure that what you're getting is the real history of who these men and who these women were. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, well, this comment, not a question, but just a heartfelt thank you for sharing this amazing body of work. Uh, question, how old were you when your grandfather passed? Sounds like you had a great relationship with him. 
I'm in my mid seventies. My grandfather died at 105 in 1979. So yes, had a long time, a long life. And he was mentally clear that whole time. Thank you. Um, what size, what is the size of your photo, photograph collection? Oh, probably close to 20,000. Wow, that, that's a lot. It's a lot. I, you know, just to give you an example, when the National Archives did an exhibit a number of years ago on the Buffalo Soldiers, I loaned them the images for their exhibition. So my is far better than the archives, you know, and it's because things were given to me and I just couldn't just throw them away. And so I have, oh God, so much stuff. I've been able to digitize maybe 15,000, but I still have a lot more that need to be digitized. Thank you. Uh, next question, they're, they're rolling in. Um, and I know some of you have your hands raised, so we'll, we'll get to those too. Thank you very much. Um, did the 9th Cavalry uh, actually help construct, help with the construction at the Presidio of Monterey? No, they did not, because that had already occurred when they arrived. But if you know a little bit about the history of Monterey, the old Presidio was used as the school of musketry. That was the school where sharpshooters of the army went from all over the country. In the cemetery at the Presidio of Monterey, you will find tombstones of soldiers that served in the 24th, 25th infantry, their children that happened to die, and you're going to see that all over the place. So the connection is there because soldiers went there to improve their skills at shooting. Thank you. Um, Nancy, I see that you have your hand raised. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yep, actually, I'm not sure if she can unmute herself. Let me oh. see if I can do that. Hang on here. Welcome, Nancy. Hi. There we go. I'm not sure if you're asking if this is the Nancy you're calling on, um, but I had a question on is this in a book form and is it in the library? I have written a series call for the love of liberty, four volumes that starts. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say it again, please? And I forgot to cut my phone off. I wasn't talking to you, series. OK. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I've written several books. Uh, uh, the four volume series is called For the Love of Liberty. Um, that is in the process now of being turned from uh, softbound to hardbound books. I've written a book called Keep Step to the Music of the Union the story of African-American army musicians from the Revolutionary War to the end of World War II. I wrote a book on chaplains. Uh, and it's called They Took a Manly Stand. And uh, that covers from the Civil War period uh, through World War II. And what other books, Christine? And a few others. And you know, some are available if you contact me, not a problem, um, not a problem whatsoever. And I'm still in the process of still writing a several that I've, you know, I started on a biography of Vance Hunter March Banks, which takes in his story from joining the army in 1894 <clears throat> to retiring from the army in 1939, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful glimpse of being a soldier during that time period. He's the one whose son would become the first uh, um, surgeon uh, in the space uh, command. Thank you. Thank you. So next question is, how did your grandfather learn photography? Was, was it a hobby for him? A hobby back then? No. He learned photography at Fort Robinson, Nebraska. 
an old German photographer who had served during the Civil War took a liking to him and taught him the art of photography. And through his camera that I still own, he took thousands of images of African-American military life that you couldn't find any place else. Thank you. So a um, couple questions about your collection. Um, what will become of your collection and um, where is the material archived and do you have oral history? I do have taped oral histories that I have done over the last 45 years. Um, most have been transcribed. Uh, my collection is probably the largest in the country dealing with the African-American soldier. I have two warehouse storages, 30 by 30, that are full. Where do they go from here? Well, I would like them to see them go on tour again where people can see them. I mean, I have the uniforms of uh, Henry O. Flipper I have the uniforms of Chaplain Prelu, Chaplain Stewart, and the uniform of Charles Young, both his uh, undress blue, the first uniform he wore as a soldier, his dress uniforms, also of Walter Howard Love, who is a man who has gone missing in history. This guy was a musician with the 24th Infantry Band. He joined the band in the early 1890s. He would serve with the band to the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. He went to the New England School of Music. He also went back into the Army as a band leader of the 49th United States Volunteer Infantry Band. He was stationed in the Philippines when he met the guy who would be president, William Howard Taft who was the governor general of the Philippines. And Tav told him, I like your band. Could you do something with Filipinos? And he did. Walter Loving formed the Philippine Constabulary Band, which is still alive today. He brought the band to America the first time in 1903 for the St. Louis exhibition. We call it today a World's Fair. In the middle of one of their performances, the lights went out. Walter tied a handkerchief on his baton. baton. The band played for two hours without missing a beat. The band was so successful, and uh, President Taft was so loved what he did. When he was elected president in 1909, it was the Philippine Constabulary Band under the baton of Walter Howard Loving that led the inaugural parade, replacing the Marine Corps band. They played in alternation with the Marine Corps band at the White House. They did a tour of the East Coast, fabulous. Today, most people don't know who this man was. This guy was so popular in the Philippines that when the Japanese took over, instead of putting him in San Tomas College with the other American detainees, he was allowed to live in his own home because he was that popular with Filipinos. And besides that, he was in the 70s. At the end of the war, when we reinvaded, the Japanese almost literally destroyed Manila. It was at this time that Walter Loving and his family, along with other people, were trying to get to safety, and they were caught by a, a, a Japanese patrol. They separated the men, and Walter Loving told the officer in charge, I'm a colonel in the United States Army. He says, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die standing. He was beheaded by the Japanese. At the Luneta today is a statue of Walter Howard Loving. This man was so popular that the national anthem that Filipinos listen to today was written by Walter Howard Lund, and I have an original copy. So that is what I have done in my 50 years of trying to keep the spirit 
of my grandfather in his generation, in my generation of love. Wow, thank you. I've uh, got a couple more questions and a couple more comments. Um, do you have copies of the orders that sent the ninth to the Presidio of Monterey? Ah, that must be your friend <laughs> asking that question. I'll have to look through my stuff because I do have a lot of orders and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would have to double check because that has been an elusive thing for people to find. So I've heard. <laughs> um, comment, thank you so much for all the work you've done. It's truly inspirational and I've learned a lot. Um, are you working with anyone to do online presentations? Something that could have a larger photos, include some oral history sound bites, basically a Ken Burns documentary type. Well, I'm working with the, Christine, the History Channel. I keep saying Christine, that's my better half. The History <laughs> Channel uh, with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, he did a segment on the Civil War. My segment was the Buffalo Soldier era. Um, I've been very fortunate over the past uh, many years. I have lectured at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, West Point, and many other places in between. In my archives, I have interviews, sound bites, of these people that I talk to. And the first question I always ask one of these old soldiers was, why did you join the army? And 99.9% .9 said this, I love the uniform and the feeling that it gave me. Just think about that. The uniform offered them their part of my country that in their time, they could not get outside of its structure. Thank you. Um, so while stationed in Monterey, the 9th Cavalry participated in many sporting events. Was this common for the Buffalo Soldiers while stationed across the United States? Yes, it was. As a matter of fact, when it came to sports, think, the library. when it came to sports and athletics, these guys were phenomenal. In my book on military athletics, I've and what I clued in that is marksmanship and all of that stuff, because it, it's all part of it. They were not only the best marksmen, but when it came to track and field, no one could beat them. Their scores would be 55 to 10. When it came to basketball, the only people that can beat them in basketball were the semi-professional black teams that they may have encountered. When it came to best baseball, the 25th United States Infantry from 1899 to 1925 was the best Army baseball team in America. And a lot of those men are in the, hall, the, the uh, Black Hall of Fame for baseball. So, yes, yeah, sports was something that you could participate in and you could be great without the stigmatization of pigmentation. And they just whoop, they just whoop people up because they could and they were good. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we're getting close on time, but we got one more question. Uh, how familiar are you with the use of African-American soldiers as military liaisons in various African countries? Well, the first was Charles Young. He went first to Haiti as the military attache. Okay. Uh, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. was the first to go to Liberia. And this is the early turn of the century. John Green would go to Liberia. He would be there from 1916 until 1919. So yeah, those black officers were used primarily in Liberia. In today's army, one of my very good friends, his name was Tony Jackson. Tony Jackson graduated from uh, San Jose State University. 
uh, was an army officer who transferred to the Jarheads, transferred to the Marine Corps. His last assignment, he was the general in charge of the Africa Command. He retired in 2013, the same time I did. He retired as the commandant of Camp Pendleton, three stars. Thank you. And um, so last question before we wrap this up, the relationship with the Seminoles, Seminoles was born from them holding slaves. Do you cover, the, cover this origin? Also, Charles Young is now General Charles Young? And he is that. Yeah, Charles Young was posthumously promoted to Brigadier General hmm. with the National Guard of Ohio. I don't know if that's been extended to the regular army yet. Could have been, and I just missed it. Uh, but he is, uh, he is General Charles, Charles Young, which he should have been a general during World War I. He was slated by Pershing as one for advancement to a brigadier position. But the way it was, he was, uh, he was retired. And you were asking the second part of that question? The relationship with the Seminoles was born from them holding slaves. Do you cover this origin? Yeah, the, the Seminoles originated in Florida, okay? At one point, the Seminoles were part of the, the Creek Confederation. And the Seminole Negro Indian scouts did not own slaves, but some Seminoles did. Just like, uh, what do we call it? The five civilized nations, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee. These were the ones that Andrew Jackson moved from their homes in 1838. The Supreme Court had said that what he was doing was unlawful, but he told the Supreme Court, make me. Trail of Tears is what it was called. When these people were moved to what was the most despicable place on our planet, it's called Oklahoma. It hasn't changed too much, but it was even worse then. All of those native people were allowed to take all of their property with them to this new Indian territory. These slaves were given their freedom and they became part of those tribes. And I've got rosters in the land that was uh, divided with the former slaves. So yes, I'm, I'm quite aware of that. A long quite aware, sorry about that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And lastly, so if we wanted to learn more about uh, you, your lectures, your collections, where would be the best way to go to find more information about you? Uh, Facebook. Facebook? Facebook or LinkedIn would have, you know, quite a bit. And if anyone's interested in, you know, me speaking or talking, I'm still available. Not a problem. Perfect. And you guys and anyone can feel free to email me and I can pass you pass along Anthony's information. Um, so I just want to say um, Anthony is a national acclaimed speaker uh, who has traveled the country, captivated audiences of all ages from the, about the history of the Buffalo Soldiers. He has spoken at institutions such as Yale, the Smithsonian, the United States Military Academy, and provided insight into the history and the life of the Buffalo Soldiers. And I just want to say it's a Wonderful, wonderful time having you speak here at the library. Thank you so much for taking the time and you know teaching us all about the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, I greatly appreciate it, and uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, and thank the audience for showing up. And my apologies not being all of that, uh, you know, a techie person, but I'm learning. Well, thank you. thank you so much, and you have a great, great evening, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and um, we will see you soon at our next history program. Thank you all, and a very special thank you to Anthony Powell, and have a great evening.